Here's some examples of different wavelengths looking at the same area, Washington DC in this case. All right. Um, what can you do from this? So you have many channels of data here, and if you think of that high dimensional space by doing things like clustering that signal, you can probably split the area into different regions, like okay, you know, this is urban, this is suburban, forest. So, what is image processing? So, some of the simplest operations, you know, we can talk about point operations. So, this is just taking single pixel elements, right? Think of that 2D array of numbers. So, take one of them at a time, do something to it, and output a different number. Okay, so that's what I mean by point wise point operations. So, you can add two images like this, you can subtract them, you can write them, or you can take the intensities of map, an image, map it for whatever transform you'd like to a different image. Um, so these are, these are the simplest ones you can do. I'll show some examples. You know, obviously they have limited maturity. Some more complicated ones are you know, actually looking at, you know, when you do an operation, you can look at a little area around the pixel you're interested in. So those are what I call spatial operations. These correspond to convolutions or nonlinear filtering. Um, or we can work with the Creative, which I hope you guys are familiar with. So transform the main operation. So I'll give an example of each of these a little bit before actually talking about the application I'm interested in. Okay, so what is adding with four? Why would I want to add two images? Um, it's one of the simplest things you can do. So imagine you somehow had many, many images of the same scene. Okay? And what could you do with averaging? Well, in this case, this astronomical data, we were looking at some galaxy in the telescope, right? And if you take a single image, you see it's actually very noisy looking. Okay? By noise, I mean, you know, so like that white flicker you used to see on your TV in the old days. So there's a lot of them in that image. Okay, so if I take that same image at five different time points and average, you know, I get this one. It's a little bit cleaner, and if I look 50 images in average, it looks a lot cleaner, and 100 times it's less. So what's, what's going on here? Why is the image getting clearer? Right? Since we're in form, I'll even ask questions. Any idea why I might get a better image by averaging? Okay. Anybody take a single process? Your average is a little faster. Okay, so that's correct. So you're assuming that the noise is high frequency, which yeah. is the case. Yeah. yeah. So another way to look at it is each image is composed of two parts. The signal, which is the actual what's out there, and then there's noise, thermal noise, whatever, any type of noise, doesn't matter where it's coming from. So we can think of it F plus noise, F is the signal, N is the noise. Now the noise we can typically assume it's going to be zero mean and independent from one image to the next, okay? So the same noise is not going to appear twice. Every time at every pixel, the noise is kind of independent. So when you average them, it tends to go to its mean, the zero mean noise, so the noise part will decrease, the signal part will not change, so it'll get strengthened in comparison to noise, so the SNR will be, okay? Now, this is obviously, can't be done that way. In every application, but your imaging has to be very still, right? So you can't just take pictures of your camera and try this. Things are moving. Um, okay, subtraction. Subtraction can be used to enhance contrast, for instance. All right. So this is a CT image where there's a contrast agent injected into the vein. So in the bloodstream, this contrast agent shows up. The, the two images top are the actual images, and you can't really tell too much about what's going on, okay? But if I, so this is before the contrast, and this is after the contrast. By subtracting that from that, you, know, you can actually see what's changing. So subtraction is a good way to see what's changing, you know, and some detail, especially things that change in time. So that's also a very simple operation. Division, also very simple. So sometimes, so this is an electron microscopy image. And in this microscope, 
it happens that the electron beam is stronger, let's say, in the middle, so what you see in the middle is brighter. And as you move out from the center, things get darker, okay? So that might be problematic. I mean, when you look at it just visually, it's kind of a problem, but if I wanted to do any sort of automated processing on say, I want to pull out automatically the dark structures. Well, I can't use a single number, single threshold for the intensity if there's the illumination is changing, right? So if I have some way of knowing what that illumination field is, then I can divide the original image by that and get something which is a, what I can call a corrected image, which is on the right. Now, by I say, okay, give me all the pixels which have intensity less than 100, that will do a much more consistent job. Okay, so these are like the simplest operations. So a little more complicated, we said our spatial operations, so we can take local averages. So local averages are good for reducing noise when we don't have that luxury of taking the 1,000 images of the same thing without the signal not changing. Okay? So if you have a single image and you want to reduce the noise, you can make an assumption that, okay, my image is a smooth function, so if I average things locally using like the convolution of that little mask, Right, and you can do that, but it typically results in blurry image. So there's many different versions of this which try to remove noise without actually blurry image from the inner filters, which I'm not actually going to be going to here. This is just to give you a flavor of what are the different things that can be done in image processing. So here's something very different. So this is a image which is corrupted by very periodic noise. Okay, so this is the top left. On the, the top right, we're looking at the Fourier spectrum of that same image. Okay, I'm not, I don't know if you're able to actually see it. No, you're not. You probably can see it too. So this is the low break frequency here, which has the image information. And what you can see a couple of dots at the fixed frequency, which are cropped in this image. Okay, just by applying this mask to that Fourier spectrum. So multiply, so this is 0 in here and 1 out here, like the 0 point is 1. Multiplying that with this image, this free spectra, and then take the English free transfer, you can very effectively do periodic notes. Okay, so the free transform comes in English processing. Intensity transformations, okay? So this is going back to pixel operations. So mapping basically gray values, say 0 to from 0 to 255 into the other range of 0 to 255 by some nonlinear function. So we can use this to enhance contrast in images. So here's an image which is probably overexposed, which is to the right, okay, by designing a map from the you know, original set of intensities to the new set of intensities. We can you know, basically create a much more detailed looking image. And similarly here, this is underexposed, so a lot of dark here, as opposed to a lot of bright. And again, you can adjust the contrast. Histograms are something we use a lot in image processing, so to basically do things like what I just mentioned, if you have an image which is underexposed like this, okay, you don't see a lot of details. The histogram is basically a count of how many times each intensity appears in an image. So we have an 8-bit image, intensities go from 0 to 255, and this is a bar graph on the x-axis we have the pin 0 to 255, the y-axis is how many times each one happens, each one occurs. Okay, you can see this image is quite dark, so there's a lot of low intensities, right? Not a lot of high intensities. This image here is uh, very bright, so you have a lot of high intensities, but not so much low intensities. Um, Let's, let's just skip this one and look at this guy. So this has a lot more detail. Right? It has what looks like a very uniform <coughs> histogram. So all, pretty much all intensities appear almost and roughly equal. Okay? So you're using all the, the, the range of bits available to you to automate the information. So histogram equalization is an automatic method which can take any of these, for instance, and create a histogram which is like this one, so you can create this image automatically out of any one of those, for instance, using this very position. Um, so there we go. So that's historical equalization. Basically, this is the input. That's the output. Okay. 
based, it's just operating on the histogram to create this balance of the image. Okay, so next thing I want to talk about, and we'll talk about these histograms for this too, is image segmentation. This is important because it's kind of going to lead into the application I want to talk about. Okay? So image segmentation is actually a very fundamental problem. Whenever you want to analyze an image automatically, it pretty much comes up. So if you have an MRI image of somebody's head and you want to analyze something about the brain, you first probably are going to want to segment out what portion of all that image is the brain. And you don't want somebody sitting there and drawing this manually on that image using something like Photoshop. That's just going to take too long. So automatic segmentation of images is an important problem. And it's a very hard one. Okay? So this is a very simple example. Okay, so how do we, so we have one object in the foreground and we have the background. Now how do we separate the foreground from the background? Well, we just choose a value in this case and say anything above that value, any intensity above that value is foreground, any intensity below that is background. Simple enough. But how do we choose that? So we just jump over that for a second. So how do we choose this threshold? Okay. Uh, well, you can do trial and error, or you can look at, for instance, the histogram of that image. Okay, so if I have this image here, this is the intensity histogram. Okay, so this peak here you see corresponds to the background, the low, low intensities, and this peak here you see corresponds to the foreground, the higher intensities. Okay, so obviously there's some overlap between the two distributions there, so you can't do a perfect job at separating the two, the background from the back foreground. Just put like putting a threshold, but you can do a relatively decent job. Um, let's see. If you have oops. so let me ask you this though. So if you have a situation like this and you want to do a little bit better job at separating the foreground and the background. So you see all these speckle like noise here. That's all the pixels in the foreground that go to dark and kind of alone or kind of left in this threshold and these white dots are what's in the background of about to the right of that threshold. Anything you can think of or what I just talked about to fix this problem? Medium printing. You could do some sort of spatial operation. Yeah, so medium printing would be one of them. Uh, if I took this image and applied some sort of local averaging first using maybe take a small, think of a three by three image with all ones in it. If I convolve that with this image, I'm gonna get a very blurry look, well, somewhat blurry look image, but also the noise will be more or less. So then applying a threshold might actually be a better job. So we use you know, combinations of several different things to it. So let's see. Let me search it. So, when are we supposed to end here? Okay? Okay, let me talk about this one. We have time to talk about this one. So I want to talk about one example we worked on several years ago, and this was using uh, PET imaging, so positive blood emission tomography to to diagnose automatically different mental diseases like Alzheimer's versus continental dementia. Okay. So what this modality images is basically how much is your brain using glucose? Okay, so you inject the radioactive isotope attached to sugar molecules basically. Okay, so active areas of your brain need sugar, need energy, so they take up more of this glucose and therefore the attached brain radioactive isotope. Okay, so then as these isotopes decay, they emit positrons, and so these generate gamma rays, and you have again a ring of detectors you see there. Basically, they're counting how many of these rays are coming in. Okay, by having, you know, again, a ring of detectors, but not just in 2D, but in 3D, you can actually reconstruct an image like this, which is showing what areas of your brain are active. Okay, so. You can see that the cortex, the cerebral cortex, which is the, the brightest part in this image, is not active. Okay? And so how do we use this for neurological diagnosis? So
So first of all, let me talk about what this is. So we have a, you know, this 3D image. One way to look at this is to look at a section of slice by slice. So if you pick up somebody's head, if you are thinking of the very top, and you start cutting sections like this, kind of virtually, and looking at the different sections, this is what you would see in this type of imaging. Okay, so from top to the bottom of the brain, right? And the blue colors are the least active, and the red colors are the most active areas. So the most glucose uptake is happening in the red areas, the least is happening in the blue, the green, blue, and the black. Okay? <coughs> So the images themselves are not colored, there's nothing in color for lights for easier interpretation. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, image processing plus pattern recognition. So in this application, we were interested in automatically classifying two types of dementia. One is Alzheimer's disease, the other is what's called frontal temporal dementia. Now, these are very hard to diagnose uh, without imaging. So typically, the way Alzheimer's patient might get diagnosed in the clinic is they go in, they take what's called a mini mental state exam, which is basically they're asked some 30 or so questions. And based on their answers, they get a score from 0 to 30. If it's very low, you know, they have Alzheimer's. And if you have frontal temporal dementia, you'll probably also get a low score. But can, doctors can't really differentiate it based on that number between these two diseases. Okay, so the question is, is there a way to do this with imaging, okay? How would that be possible? Well, that would be possible if, you know, certain parts of your brain are affected in one disease and other parts are affected in the other one, okay? So this actually indeed turns out to be the case. So, using Pattern recognition and image processing in conjunction, we can actually find the areas which are best discriminatory between the two diseases. How do we do this? Okay, so I'm basically summarizing right now a semester of work here. But. So imagine you have two groups of patients, one a known case of Alzheimer's disease, the other a known case of frontal temporal dementia. You can put them in your scanner and take images for each one of them. So now you have images from both groups. And basically, pattern recognition will look for what's common between the groups, but what distinguishes the two groups. Okay? So there are many different algorithms to do this. You know, decision tree classification is one of them, one of the simplest ones. Okay? And doing this, you know, we were able to you know, identify these regions here. You know, these are different projections of the brain showing which regions are the best uh, to distinguish between these two diseases. And, you know, okay, so I said, you know, in all cases, the way to know between the two diseases actually is once somebody dies by doing an autopsy, you can tell which disease they have. So this is how we knew which one is which. And they had previously had MRI scans. So and so automatic classification using this type of method, we were actually able to do 94% accuracy. Now, why are we even interested in doing this automated versus a radiologist to do this? Um, there, you know, depending on the application, there are different answers. You know, one might be that you know, radiologists are, you know, they, they, their time is expensive. They're not available in every hospital, right? Okay, so here, when you get hospital, they are available, but imagine you're somewhere else, well, that might not be the case. Also, even though they're very well trained, they're subjective. Okay. Because the computer is not subjective, it's always going to be the same thing, no matter what. So, okay, probably radiologists might argue with you on several of those points, but those are far. So, as time permits, let me talk about a very different, but still a kind of medical application, or at least biological application. So one problem we've been working on more recently is what's called connectomics, okay? So connectomics is basically the mapping of the complete neural circuitry of an animal. For instance, you know, this verb is one of the first ones to detect it. It's called the C elegance, and it happens now only in 302 neurons. Okay, so it's a very simple animal, only 302 neurons. But 
it's a good one because you know, this problem happens to be very hard. So what connect Thomas means in the context of this animal is basically say, okay, so these 302 neurons are connected in this way. Basically, it's a circuit diagram, okay? Now, you can notice that there's not 300 blocks here. That's because you know, there's different types of neurons and the same type of neuron will usually have the same type of connectivity to other types. But it's basically a kind of a blueprint of, of this animal in terms of how its neurons are connected. Um, now, why does it matter to know how the motor neurons are connected to the receptor neuron and all that? Well, so there might be a couple of arguments. One is to build better models of brains. So if you have this, maybe you can predict how this animal is actually going to behave. Um, obviously, that's not very important for a bird, but if you could do the same thing for retina, for instance, right, you could build artificial retinas or retinal implants, things like that. You know, it was how to build a circuit between them, right? That's one. Way to think about it. Um, another one is to understand certain diseases. I mean, there's diseases that are you know, cause neurodegeneration, okay? So it changes the wiring of certain circuits. And um, to understand that, you can have you know, one animal which is affected by this disease and another one which is not, and you can look at their wiring diagrams. So the way to approach this problem is you know, to look at the brain at a very different resolution than the previous application. So the previous application, those images are consistent of 3D images where each pixel is about a millimeter or so in each of its dimensions. Okay, that gives you a very manual level view. But for this application, we actually want to look at individual neurons and see how they're wired. So we're actually talking about nanometer resolution. Orders, many orders of magnitude smaller than previous. Obviously, you can look at smaller things. You can't look at a human brain like this. The amount of data was, I think, be more than what we have on Earth today. And the entire amount of data on Earth is probably less than a human brain image at this resolution. Okay? Now, for uh, one of our collaborators here on, on campus is interested in looking at the retina, and of the retina, actually, and they sectioned up. So the way it's in which the image diverse is you have your previous specimen, you section it into these two sections, you put each one under a bunch of microscope, take images. Okay? So that amounts to about 20 terabytes for a portion of our travel span. Okay, so you can think of how much they were. Um, and what we are interested in is ultimately to segment, so we talked about segmentation, to segment each neuron in this data set. And also to figure out how they're connected to each other. That means finding synapses. I don't know if you remember from your bio, high school biology, you don't want to make synapses with each other. Okay? And in these images, which I will show you, you can also find synapses. Okay? So you are basically now figuring out where the wires are going, where they're making connections, and so you try to get the circuit. And manual segmentation obviously is very slow in this case, so we want to implement methods. 20 terabytes of data, that, that's a lot. We'll store somewhere to look at. Just to give you an idea, uh, the previous one, this C. elegans group, was nowhere near that. So this is much simpler than that. And one person you know, sitting down and doing it manually took about 10 years. So, so here's how it works the imaging. So we have this tissue here. It's cut into these thin sections, 40 to 90 nanometer thick, and each one is put under an electron microscope. So we get images like this. So this is a very zoomed out view, so it doesn't give you a very beautiful lesson. I don't know, I'll show you some more images. And here's just what I've been talking about, right? So 300 neurons, manual construction took about 15 years. A fly brain has an order of magnitude or more neurons than that. Okay, then the following was a human brain as sent to level. So So the first thing, so I'll talk about a couple of problems here we have to solve. 
first one is actually aligning the images. And there are several problems here. Because the, we're imaging at such a high resolution, each 2D section in that previous image, so we're cutting out 2D section of cubic all that we have, we got the micro microscope, but because the resolution is so high, we can't actually imagine the entire thing at once. The electron microscope has the moment stages and take many different images which then have to be stitched together. And that sounds simple, but it actually has some complications, such as you know, there's you know, um, optic aberrations, so the things not perfectly like, line up when you put them on top of each other. There's some stretching going on in 2D because of the optics that has to be accounted for. But that's somewhat easy. The harder part is assembling the 2D sections back together because you're cutting them with a knife, right? And you're distorting it. No matter how good you cut, you're going to stretch things, squash things a little bit. So to build a 3D volume, you can't just put these images on top of each other. You have to align them. So this is the problem of image registration. Okay? So a little bit about how we do that. So we use the Fourier transform, the property of the Fourier transform, actually. And that is basically the Fourier shift here. If you shift a signal in space, you're multiplying it by a complex exponential. So by taking two images which have some amount of overlap in them, so the adjacent tiles, as the microscope moves, have to have tiles, okay, so have to have that overlap in that part, okay? We can use this property to figure out what that shift is. So take the Fourier transform of the two, take the complex conjugate on the second one, multiply them, normalize, okay? And take the inverse Fourier transform and if they were perfect in the same signal, just shift between them, you would see a, see a single direct delta, obviously. But they're not. There's only some portion of the information that's common to both. But what you see is a peak at the correct location, at the very least, which you can find. So we figured out that if you have about 10% overlap between the two adjacent images, you can figure out that displacement between the two using this technique. And we actually you know, build the whole system to assemble both the 2D sections and apply the 2D sections to each other using this property. So I kind of dwell on that too much because I want to talk a little bit about the segmentation problem. So I'm going to show you this movie works in a second, the data set I mentioned. So this is from the Mark Lab at University of Utah here, okay? This is a rabbit retina, and 341 sections, each section 99 years thick. There's about 1,000 tiles, maybe 1,000 inches per section. Each image is 4,096 by 4,096 pixels, and make up of 16.5 terabyte volume. So this image, this is one section. These little squares you see here are the tiles. Each is a 4,000 by 4,000 image. The diameter of this image is about 130,000 pixels. Okay, so there's 341 of them. So this has been actually, this data set has been assembled automatically using the amount of sizes and Okay, so you can see there's a lot of artifacts. So they're working on getting a better data set than we see. So you can see all the different processes. At this level of detail, you don't see much of this. But think of this as like a spaghetti bowl. There's many, many little wires there, all of them made of need to be somehow analyzed. So we've solved the easier part of the problem, which is to put the data set together. Now somebody has to follow the wire somehow. Okay. Now, here are some of the wires done manually. Okay. So by sitting down now with our reconstructed data set and going section by section, just for a few of the wires, and building this annotation. What we want to do is to do an automatic but for all of the, the wires in there. Okay. This is probably only like 2 or 3 percent of the information that's in there available. Okay. So this is a little to this slide, we should start with this. 
So, so here's a zoomed in version now of the small, small, small portion of that image. Okay? So this is probably only a few hundred pixels by a few hundred pixels. Remember the whole thing had a diameter of 130,000 pixels. So at this level of detail now we see, what we see are basically all the cell membranes, but also membranes of intracellular structures. So here's one cell, okay? And then there's a mitochondria inside of it. And there's another cell. And these are probably vesicles, synaptic vesicles in here. So, and then there's probably a synapse with the cell next to it. And here's another cell. And here's another cell. So all of these little round objects, more or less round objects, are cells. Dark is the site of our mitochondria, so this is a And small dots are either vesicles or microtubules. So now we have to somehow build a image processing algorithm which is able to say, okay, you know, find the boundary of this cell here without getting confused by any of this stuff uh, here. You obviously can't just choose a threshold and say, yeah, and below that is a membrane, because you have all this dark stuff. This is what we're trying to get. This is the ground truth, what we call the ground truth, annotated by a human. Okay, so a human this. So these are the membranes we want to extract from this image, the cell membranes. So we can then say, okay, now we know the membranes, and here's one cell, here's another cell. Okay. So it's a very challenging problem. Um, you know, us and several other groups are working on, again, using kind of recognition as a problem. And the idea is basically to start from pairs of images like this. So the input image, the actual image, and a hand-drawn annotation of it for what we want to find. And basically, what we're going to learn is a function based looking at a small area around here and mapping that either to a 1 or a 0. Is this a membrane or not? Okay. So that can be done with many different techniques, just like in that Alzheimer's diagnosis case. Decision trees, linear discriminant analysis, artificial neural networks. They're all different ways to kind of approximate that decision function. Okay. So that is the topic of a uh, mission or machine learning course. But in, in this problem, what we're particularly interested in is how do we, how does a human do this so well? Because basically, if I show a few of these images to you, you'd be almost doing, a, doing almost like as good a job as uh, somebody who's trained in this. In the I mean, okay, there are going to be some places where you're going to get confused, but you'll be doing a really good job in just a matter of a few minutes. So human brain, is very well adapted to this, these kinds of tasks. So our visual, visual system works extremely well. Okay? Trying to do this with a computer algorithm, you know, it's, it's hard. Because the main difference probably is, you know, to make a decision here to say, is this a membrane or not, the human brain actually uses a lot of context. It doesn't just look there, to look at kind of what's the petition, what's being repeated in this image, what is the general properties of the image? All of that is somehow, all of those very global properties are somehow summarized and used in making this decision. On the other hand, if a computer algorithm, typically we just look at a small area of our group to try to make that decision. And if I just gave you a, you know, if I covered all this image up and just showed you a little portion here, you wouldn't be able to make that decision with a library anymore. You wouldn't be able to tell me if that's a memory. So one big challenge in, in my field is how do I use non-local information to make both decisions, okay? So that's an active research topic that my group works on. Um, so let's see. Okay. So one idea we have been working on is basically using what we call context. So I'm going to, I find this easier to illustrate with these images rather than the, the microscopy images. So suppose now we have images of horses, okay? And the goal is to somehow separate the horse from the background, okay? So at any pixel then, I have to say this is either part of a horse or not part of a horse. So 
at this pixel, which is at the center of that red square, let's say I have access to the information of the red square, and I have to make a decision. So I use what's one of my pattern recognition techniques then, decision tree or artificial neural network, to learn that map. Because again, I'm going to assume I have examples from humans of this image, and you know, somebody committed it from what supports and what's not supports, and I have a bunch of images like that. Okay? So I learned this function, and it gives me this. So you can see it's not perfect, it gets confused at certain locations. It does have a you know, somewhat decent job. Okay? Generally, it's not, of course. So the reason it can't do a very good job is because locally, with that information only in a red square, things are ambiguous. Okay? So and our idea is to basically now learn a second decision function, that's second half, again using that recognition. But this time we base it not only on this red square, but also on the information that's in the red square, which is from the output of the Classifier. Okay? And we find that now we're able to make much more reliable decisions. So, you know, we'll get to the reason you know, why this might be. But effectively, what's going on here is we're using on what we call context, which is the output of the first classifier. So you can think of it like this. Okay, if stuff next to me is part of this object, then I'm probably of the subject. If stuff next to me is mostly not part of the subject, then I'm probably not part of the object myself. So it's kind of filtering based on that. But let me give you a let me jump ahead here first. But but doesn't sorry to interrupt, I know you're getting close to the end, but doesn't the human brain do this two different ways? The human brain has one side that, that takes general shapes and maps the details to the shapes on the other side. So aren't you doing this a little more complex than I, I don't think anybody really knows how the human brain really does it. I mean all we know about the human brain is that the first levels of visual processing what the retina does and what maybe the V1 and V2 sort of primary visual cortex. Okay, it does things like find edges and images, lines and images. And then the next level probably tries to perception and group them together. But how does it actually go about finding a horse in an image? Is anybody's guess at this point? Okay, so it probably uses lots of different things. It has no probably has no jokes about the shape, but it's seen before. Probably not just doesn't just use visual information, it probably use all sorts of other semantic information to help make decisions. So I would argue that the human brain probably does this in a much more complex way than so that's the challenge. I mean, we are still using very simple mechanisms to try to effectively use context, but even though this is a challenge, um, yeah. So the, the human brain, you know, I don't think anybody really knows the answer of how it does the high level processing. The low level, yes, we have some idea. Yes, it finds edges and images, it groups them together. And that by itself is not really enough to say that, okay, this is a horse, this three speaks is a part of a horse. I don't know if that answers the question or not. So, somewhat, but you're not sitting here just developing a target based on, on each pixel in the image, are you? Okay, so let me, maybe I, I'm not getting this across very well. My goal is not to mimic the human brain. My goal is to ultimately understand the human brain, but the methods I develop in that doesn't necessarily need to be inspired by the human brain. So I, there's no argument I'm making here that's saying that this way of processing is like what the human brain is doing. I'm just saying that it, I think that human brain is successful because it uses context. And I'm not saying it doesn't this way or that another way. I'm just saying, okay, here's one way we can try to use context. Okay? And then, yes, you know, kind of a circular thing, though, we can take these methods and apply it to my possible images of a brain, and maybe ultimately one day we can understand how the brain actually does it. Okay? But the goal here is not. Some people, okay, there's other researchers who, whose goal is to build systems that do image processing like the human brain. Uh, I would just say I'm loosely motivated by it. I'm not a neuroscientist, so I don't, I don't constrain myself to try to make the human brain because, you know, I, I don't know how to do it. I'm, this work is more statistical than neuroscience. Okay, so 
just to wrap up here. One way to think about this is this pixel, let's say this is a red square, is a 3 by 3 square. So the decision at this point is based only on this 3 by 3 information, right? Now, if you think about it, if I use, so my next classifier, it's going to use a, to make a decision at this, three by, uh, at this pixel, it's going to use a 3 by 3 information from this image, but each of the pixels in this 3 by 3 area themselves were determined by a 3 by 3 area around each of them. So effectively now I'm using information from a 5 by 5 area to make this decision. And this is obviously being that implicit. So you might say, well, why not just do this 5 by 5 immediately to, to get that decision? There's several reasons actually that this is much better than doing that. First is, um, you know, again, this goes into pattern recognition theory, but if you have too many, if your input dimensional is too large, you get into all sorts of problems about estimating that function. Overfitting, you need many, many examples. Um, and so this is a, this avoids that problem, okay? And you can use kind of effectively information from far away in an implicit manner. So by repeating this a few times, you can actually get pretty decent segmentation. So let's go back, let's see what we have here just to wrap up. Going back to the microscope images. So we have to somehow quantitatively evaluate our methods to see if we're doing a good job. And the way we do this is, okay, so we have, again, the human annotations. We don't just use them for learning that function, mapping, but also for evaluating. So typically you keep one test separate, one set of images separate for testing, which you haven't learned from. You learn from one set of images and apply it to the other one, see how well it does, how well does it match the human. And by, so the only point I want to make in this is that this x axis here, this second graph here, is the, the classifier that has been progress using context. So the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, each using context from the previous one. And this is just an accuracy method. Okay, so we can actually improve the accuracy of the results by you know, this methodology. Okay. Um, and that's some visual examples. So two different images, okay, and of the same basic tissue, two different sections. And the goal is again to find membranes, so this is the human annotation. The green squares basically show some problem areas. So RLF is a very traditional processing method that we can think of. Uh, it involves computing some features and special you know, about learning. And then these are all the, the different methods that we have been working on. But basically, if you look at this one, it's kind of our latest results. Uh, basically, using this methodology I just talked to you about, using one classifier after another one to make better decisions. You can see that you know, compared to this, it's able to kind of distinguish between its a mitochondria and membrane. You can imagine, you know, looking at a very small area, this is not really possible, but by using this idea, we're able to discriminate between these different structures. So we're nowhere near perfect, though. So our collaborators in neuroscience still can't take these algorithms and not just apply it to their own data take the results and work with it, right? So maybe we're like 95% accurate, but that's not enough. So I'll, I guess I'll just end there and see if you guys have questions I can try and answer. Great, thank you for coming
call it action. It's not actually a PYD, it's led to our group like a 7 by 7 area. Okay, so there's a 49 years of this vector. And we have a neural network component in there from the around 10 million nodes. And that's what we're doing, very simple. And in the second one, it's not connected to just this, the pixels of this one, but also the input one, so it sees all the input and also the output of the first one. So it's not twice the dimensional of the first. So the value that comes out is the value that comes out is the value that comes out. Oh, the value that comes out, okay. That depends on the application. In this application, the value that comes out is, am I force? Or is this pixel of the force? So it's a number of these here are one, basically says, I don't like the distribution. The other one is, uh, again, a number of these are one, which says, how likely is this pixel a member of the cell? Anything else? Done. Thank you again, Tolga.